can you talk uh, a little about your role and who you are and the work you do, please? Uh, yeah, uh, well, my name's Judith Vickers and I'm Operations Manager for LifeShare in Manchester. Uh, LifeShare is the oldest homeless charity in Manchester. It was founded in 1984. Charitable status came for the organisation in 89. Uh, originally, we were sort of like a seven-day-a-week sort of suit van style, going out uh, every night, uh, feeding from the, you know, the van, doing hot meals. Um, sort of the start of the 90s, um, they, we require, you know, we thought that really people need more dignity rather than just a, a bacon butty on the street. So we took our service indoors into the Chad Street Ragged School on the Saturday and the Sunday where we could offer more services. Uh, still doing the, um, the sort of, you know, the van, the soup meals down on Tower Street and Piccadilly Gardens. Um, around about the mid 90s, we had a big resettlement project. Uh, we brought the bond scheme to Manchester, brought a needle exchange onto our vans, helped found at the Booth Centre, Manchester Action on Street Health. So a lot of support in other organisations. End of the 90s, um, the uh, outreach teams identified a very small pocket of young men in the set city that were selling sex. It wasn't about sexuality. So the approach Comet Relief and the MSWAT project was born, which was the Male Sex Workers Outreach Project. Um, so they, they were with the young lads. Uh, again, it wasn't about sexuality. It was about survival sex. Um, Manchester didn't really accept that there were any issue around male sex work. Nobody believed life share that there was this small, small pocket of young men in the city selling sex. At that time, around about 2000, I was working for Lifeline as an under-19 substance misuse worker and uh, specialised in, in child sexual exploitation, sex work, things like that. So I was seconded by the DAS to go and work with LifeShare to see, is this true? Have we got this pocket of young men? What kind of you know provision do we need to put to it? And X, Y and Z. Um, so that's sort of how my journey began with LifeShare. Um, and then around 2003, I was doing... Um, on the last year, my BA social work. Uh, so I did um, my dissertation on the hidden population of male sex workers in Manchester. And my friend, uh, Mary Lang, uh, well, Mary Wowell at the time, she was doing a PhD on the geographical mapping of sex workers and she was going to go out to Asia and do the triangle X, Y, and Z. I was like, no, 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 no. You need to keep this more like Europe, cities in thingies so we can, and then we've got two solid evidence base we can hit the council with uh, public health everything you know and really show that, that we have got you know this this group of men in the city so both of us passed she passed a PhD, I got my BA, um, and then, you know, we went, um, so I'm a bit of a whistle top saw this really, but we, we then, uh, so that was running great, uh, as I say, I then came into employment with LifeShare, I left Lifeline about 2007, um, and around that time, uh, then I was a full-time sort of support with them, and then... Am I okay to get going? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. see. So, share emails if we can, Judy will give you... I'll link you in, I'll do you an intro. Thank you very much. Take care, have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, so then um, at that time, sort of, um, you know, we were, we were seeing lots of... Um, there was quite a tough rhetoric uh, in the city around truancy officers that were coming in and sweeping young kids out of Piccadilly Gardens and nobles and things like that. So when we was on, on the outreach, we were finding very small pockets of young people drinking, smoking drugs, just doing what they do. My young men were heterosexual young men, so there was lots of relationships forming, lots of pregnancies. Um, Life share work with the risky behaviour and not the postcode. So I was finding myself going on pre birth assessments to Huddersfield, Leeds, different places. Um, so I went back to Comet Relief and I said, Look, we need to go more generic and we need to work with any, any young person in any form of exploitation and it's many ugly forms. I came from a croupier background in the 80s. So I, I came up with the acronym CARDS, which is Crisis Assessment Referral Diversity Service. You can 
cards on the table, how you dealt them, how you deal them, are two different things, my friend. <laughs> so, Comic Relief then funded the cards project. Um, so, then I was like team leader over the cards. Uh, around about 2012, um, we uh, had real issues with our young people not wanting to go to probation. There was this like rolling door of short sentences coming back out, accommodation loss. So, we set up the Meaningful Use of Time program where you young people could come and do the actual probation with us they did you know do an hour's appointment uh looking at the perhaps risky offending behavior drug use uh, or you know filling in applications on uh, manchester move things like that so that service then added a criminal criminology to um you know uh, um can't get the word out you know so we were dealing with sort of the offending behavior so our um Mission statement sort of thing is Lysha works to uh, break the cycle of homelessness, offending, uh, reduce harm and promote health. Uh, so we added the offending bit um, into that statement in about 2012. Um, and then proceeded to then take over as operations manager for, for the whole service. So it's now I'm sort of responsible for the live shares, a seven day a week provision. So we do weekend breakfast. Um, our, we became ho- homeless. Uh, we were been in the Charter Street Ragged School for about 33 years and the gentrification of the city pushed us out so the homeless charity even though we held on by the grit of the teeth you know um down at the ragged school as long as we could we then found ourselves homeless even though we got andy burnham who's you know wanting to do x y and z nobody seemed to be interested in our cause ended up out in trafford with our weekend breakfast service but i've been fighting now we are back in the city sort of center we also do um, a Christmas project because another thing that Live Share identified um, 33 Christmases ago uh, that <laughs> everywhere shuts, uh, even the Christian organisations um, close the doors. So Live Share opened the doors from the 23rd through to the 29th, all run by volunteers. And we have three meals a day doctors, nurses, podiatrists, doggy well I brought into it. Um, and COVID nearly stopped it last year. So so, you know, at first I had great plans. We were going to do a joint project um, with Nymos and the Hippodrome, which was under threat of being knocked down and turned into an apartment block. So I said, right, we'll do a big campaign to save Nymos, do our Christmas project in there, get our patron Maxine Peake. So plan A was opening at two o'clock on the 23rd, circus performance, speech off Maxine, food, Home Alone movie, you know, plan B went to the road to the the road next to Nymus we ended up on plan D which was serving uh, from the doorway in the city sent a a Christmas dinner but Christmas still went on Covid did not stop Christmas so uh, yeah just so my job is just to try and bring uh, like all the funds keep the service running adapt as well to the needs of the city which has always been my share's uh, slogan is it adapting to the needs of, of the city so now we've had to look at digital bringing in different things platforms yeah so i know that's a bit of a a, a witter <laughs> it's, it's amazing I, I, it, it's important to to just be aware you know so many people just i have no idea how much things change how much goes on behind the scenes yeah so well it is and, and it's, I think because live share um, we've built so much trust among the um you know, we call them Manchester's finest so within the homeless community you know sort of thing um, and we have a a lot of respect really out there on the streets um, and we always hear things I think that are moving and trends in drug use and things like that so I, I remember I think it was about 2013 when when the issue with Spice started first coming and I, I remember um, 
again, there was quite a tough rhetoric in the city uh, around cannabis and people smoking, and they they had the three strikes. So if you got stopped once, you got it confiscated a warning. Second, confiscated and a warning. The third time, you were going to get yourself, you know, spanked and either depending on what you were carrying, whether it would be intent to supply or whatever. So a lot at, at the time we was a little M, uh, M swap. I think then we were just about changing over. Um, and like one of our lads came into the office and he'd been to Dr. Herman's and he had, uh, you know, this, I think it was Pandora's box in this shiny packet and what have you. And, you know, and at a time the shops weren't allowed to give any harm reduction advice. So they couldn't tell them you only need a tiny little bit of this, you know what I mean? And in the minds of, of the young people was, well, it must be safe because I'm buying it in the shop and paying my taxes on it. Yeah. So it must be sort of all right. So this lad, his normal routine was he'd start at the back of Minchell Street courts he'd roll himself a spliff of normally cannabis yeah set off cruising down underneath the towpath up the canal and by the time he got to Tarisley if he hadn't have you know met a punter or whatever he'd like have them roll another spliff and sort of cruise back down around the things so he said that and all he can remember from that night is being at the back of Minchel Street Courts thinking oh, it's synthetic, it mustn't be quite any good. So he builds a nice big spliff and then the next thing, the sun was coming up, he was in Sackville Gardens, his trolleys were around his ankles and he knew something awful had, had happened to him. You know, so at this point I was like, what is this stuff? So although we knew by lobbying, raising awareness of it, because even the drug services hadn't heard about it, um, me and Julie Boyle, the team leader at the time, um, you know, we ended up training school nurses and different things, CGL, talking to all in because we then started doing our research about what it was. Uh, we knew by criminalising it, it wasn't going to stop it. It's not going to take, but it would take it away from the easy access because we was having ambulances at the service every day, bringing people around, horrendous because it was, you could literally get it in four shops between our office and Piccadilly Gardens where you could buy it. One day I remember uh, this, we were supposed to be going, taking a young lad to the hostel. Um, and I said, so he, he turned up and what have you, and he's looking all sheepish. And I said, have you, have you got your ID? And he's like, I said, where's your ID? And he'd left it in one of the shops. It wasn't Dr. Herman's, it was um, Radar or something it was called. As security on a £10 bag of spice. So I'm on the phone to the police, absolutely fuming, right, yeah, you know, because it's like, you know, he's giving them tick of this drug as well, you know, and now uh, the copper I used to call Big and Daft, I said, Big and Daft, you better get round there, and then, so Big and Daft, bless him, did go round to get the passport, but there was no offence on the shop, because it's just like going to a petrol station, he was saying, and you forgot your thing, so I'm going, no, it's not! You know, um, but yeah, this is what we were, de were dealing with in days of basis. So we got Vice up from London and we made a documentary about Spice Boys in Manchester to raise awareness. We were then getting calls from America. We were getting calls from Portugal all over the place with different people. So, yeah, there's been lots of things just in my short journey with Life Share that we've seen. When we was NSOC as well, we was quite, we put down two paedophile rings as well, you know, so it's like there's great stuff that, that goes on, you know. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Is uh, you know, do, do all of your successes get recognised, remembered? Um... Well, no, that, when you need them to, really. Sometimes, yeah. or maybe not, it's like the Coalition of Relief I formed in 2015 for Manchester, um, which is still going to this day, um, although COVID has stopped us meeting on a monthly basis. From those, and it what set off it was me and Mikey, uh, who works for Camwich Community Action at the time. Um, there was lots of small groups all feeding in the city centre, falling over themselves, going round feeding with sleepers. We had tent city in the place. A lot of these small groups didn't have policies. They just had their goodwill to want to go and do something and make a change. Um, even down to, to organisations now that have, have come out of that coalition. Me and Mikey sort of brought them all down to Danzig Street, had monthly meetings, helped them with policies. So now Coffee for Craig who were started off as two of my Sunday volunteers who when a 
Misha's brother passed, started going out, giving brews, feeding at Piccadilly Gardens. So I helped Coffee for Craig then come to the be in their organisation in their own right now and their own building they've got. Uh, the same with Reach Out in the community. They were a family group um, and they were working as mad dogs, the family all fell out so I chaired the split up of those things and any helped money that had been raised for those organisations and breaking that down same with Spin um, Well Spin which has now been took over as an ABEN so all these things the big change for Manchester the big change came out of those coalition meetings because from the first coalition meetings we, we met we, the homeless charter for Manchester came out of that so really maybe not that it's recognised that that was out of hand but it's not why we do it it's like you know we know that came out of our meetings but we don't need anything on a thing to say um, it did but yeah most of where you'll find there will be some form of life share connection in, in anything uh, I will be very vocal um, you know I've sat on strategic groups for 15 years like crime and disorder modern day slavery for about eight now um, Andy Burnham's uh, GM I'm sorry Andy this is not going to work this is jobs for boys that was his mass gateway so he come up at the meeting and I stood up and I said this is not going to work any any of our really hard to reach clients are not even going to get past question six they're going to be flung out it's not going to work the only ones are going to be making money are the ones that you've employed to set up this system Maz Gateway came in it rolled anyway even though I was up and saying it wouldn't work and guess what it didn't work you know so it's still there it's being tweaked and things like that but all you can do is still keep putting your two penny worth in sometimes they were, <clears throat> yeah and I'm just like a dog with a bone I don't just don't go away with it I've still got half a, con a container village on my mate's farm all I wanted was a piece of my, my idea was because like Burnham came in and the city gentrification of the city so you're knocking down um, an old pub yeah and you're going to put a big high glass tower on it yeah but you flatten that ground now, but you don't actually plan to build on that for another eight to 12 months, maybe, or even six months. So I come along with my 10 or 12 containers that have got showers in them, they've got sleep facilities, toilets, healthcare, everything. So we've got that. We put that on that land. My mate's got a haulage company, so we're not even asking anybody to do that. Bring them, put them down. And then about the month before the due to build on that site, we come and we move the containers to the next site that's just been flattened. And that way we hopscotch around the city because what I was finding before, I also had 3.3 million and a property developer who was going to make a big gateway to the north. We, were, we had St Cuthbert's Church who wanted to redevelop their site. They had the land and everything. I had the 3.3 million. I was going to do it on the Burnley model. Yeah put all the proposals together and when what when we got to the stage with one of the council workers she said Judy I'll be honest with you don't put any more time or effort into this because I had the bishop looking for who the rights to the land because apart on the land there was an old nunnery so the one of the first actions were find the nuns on the run so because we had the permission of the congregation of Cuthberts but this one bit of land within Cuthberts still belonged to these nuns so I had an archdeacon in London trying to find these nuns and huge piece of work and then they uh, done, done a Grimshaw thing was she said it's it's part of Andy Burnham's gateway to the north so you are not going to get permission there to build on that even though it's a wonderful thing because within a mile and a half you've got an Woodward Court another supported accommodation within half a mile you've got a food bank thing and apparently if you have these things it lowers the va value of the real estate that's going to be built because the, there's these services for people who are marginalised or poor and it makes the area look marginalised and poor. So even though we had this money, yeah, that wasn't in, they weren't interested in, in this. But again, not going away with that idea, but the container idea would be, able, would be a perfect solution. But you're going against... Um, so, you know, so you've got the politicians there wanting to look like they're doing things, but they've got another agenda. You know, I mean, I think I made national news. I think I ended up in the front page of the Mirror because uh, I, I told Andy Burnham and um, he took the homeless charter for for business and thingy. 
he put Tim Heatley head of it, who's the biggest property developer, you know, who's actually taking other things. So I said to him, I don't you think that's a little bit hypocritical? Yeah, so Manchester charity worker criticises Andy Burnham, telling me, yeah, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, but this is sort of some of the, you know, the obstacles that, that you're dealing with. I mean, you sat in this office today. Um, we, we moved in here in 2007. Nobody wanted to, look, to rent in this area. The first gentrification, it was in 2006, where we had to move out of Mount Street because that building had been sold and it was going to be turned into an old singing, dancing, um, you know, apartment block. Uh, the music studios and live share were in the basement. Yeah, that's the now the car park. Part. so I found this building as I say nobody wanted to rent it was at a reasonable price and you know that was 2007 I'm still here today now I mean bless the landlord he keeps trying to put me rent up but I keep saying oh well you know you can have an extra hundred pound a year that's about all I can afford bless him and you know I was this your dad's baby now you know your dad really wanted me to be here with this charity so bless him I keep blackmailing him on his dad but I, I know that what I pay for two floors he could rent out uh, he, he could get that for each floor in this building you know um, and again now uh, because it's so gentrified they don't want they don't want the people coming to the services when we were here originally. I hope I'm not diversing too much. No, no. Uh, <laughs> when, we, when we got this building here, as I say, we was the M swap. So it was literally five minutes to the mail beat, cruising beat there. And then we go five minutes the other way. You had the needle exchange. You had ADS uh, drug services. You know, you had other charitable services that we need. All those have been moved out now. They've gone. Yeah, so the needle exchange is got closed down as soon as the needle exchanges went that's when we started having needles in the car parts again and things like that so yeah so I, I've seen lots of different changes and, and for me things are going backwards a bit if you like you know because um, we we had to then go I'd say around about 2017 again to look at doing a lot of it from I mean universal credit coming in and things like 2015 when the welfare reform was beginning to start that's when I knew sort of thing we'd have to start doing a digital element because everything was going to go online um, you see people waiting you know seven weeks for food social workers on the phones with families you know in absolute dire dire straits so I had to go back to being a food bank a bit really when we moved away from that we were never like a trussel trust food bank we were a food bank that specialized uh, mainly for sort of maybe social workers hostel workers so it wouldn't be where people could come up the, the worker would phone up we'd do three days of food which is specific to that family so you know if it was halal or anything but and we were maybe just doing I don't know, 10 parcels a week or something like that. Suddenly, when the UC come in, we were going up to sort of 20, 30 parcels a week and things like that. So, um, and then numbers went up at our breakfast project when we was at the Charter Street Ragged School. We used to think like a, at one stage, a busy Sunday would be 70, you know, 75, you know, 80 maybe on a Saturday. Um, and we were seeing regular numbers of like 125, you know, because... I'm not saying everybody was a rough sleeper that came through the project because we, we dealt with people who were living in food and fuel poverty and if you come to Live Share's door, you're welcome in with open arms so, so there's no asking, you know, or ticking boxes, if you like, because some, some of our clients say that they, they go to another service and they've got to do a workshop in order to get a meal, so you've got to take part in an activity which ticks a box for a funder or something like that where there was nothing, no rules for us if you're there at the door you're welcomed in you know um, yeah so things have adapted but yet yeah, things are still looking like they're going you know backwards we were demonised a bit by the council um, we were accused of this was probably around about the when remember when you could still get the crisis loans 
So before the before the welfare reforms and systems changed, um, when they could get crisis loans, at that time the the council sort of had a bit of a, a view that we was an enabler because we were giving people free food, yeah, and we were giving people clean clothes and stuff like that. Then we were enabling people to live on the streets. The minute the crisis loans stopped, and then they had to contact their local council for an emergency payment suddenly now the council wanted to know us because they wanted to refer people to our food provision because they didn't want to have to give out the money or the vouchers so even just seeing changes in mindsets on you know councils i mean i have constant arguments um now with the sleepers team and things like that because um you know they're not allowed to give out somebody a sleeping bag or a clean pair of boxer shorts or things like that because they are they're seen then as enabling somebody on the streets but to me it's a humanitarian right you know even to the point where the count still drives me insane i sent one of my workers out on the count now they counted 40 of sleepers but matter of fact really um, my worker said to me we should have counted at least 46 he said but one guy didn't have a sleeping bag he was clearly asleep he said he, he was clearly could see he was a rough sleeper and not a drunk passed out on the street. But because he wasn't in a sleeping bag and he wasn't, he, always, he doesn't quite fit the criteria. You know, you're slapped in a, in a bus station, you know, then you're on the bus bench and it's like you've got a roof over your head. So we're not counting him either. So again, the way the things are counted is, is very dodgy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. Sorry, next question. Um, so, can you tell me about the structures you work in and under? Um, structures within our organisation, such a thing. Or well, well, that you know, you, you, you the, um, there's there's lots of policies and ways ways to do things, organisations, bureaucratic structures, uh, cities. Uh, what 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 structures do you have to? Uh, do you work in and have to respond to to achieve the work? Well, my structure, my structure for me within my own organisation um, and sometimes it's the biggest battle, actually, because sometimes if I'm going out and I'm speaking on a strategic board, um, you know, and I'm set talking about policies or changing things and, you know, there might be council workers, police, health and everything, they listen and get it. And then sometimes my trustees, who've, because I am answerable to a board of trustees, they don't quite get it. So motivating sometimes change within my, my own organisation is sometimes the hardest thing because they'll think, well, we've always done it this way for this long and, you know, I've been here 30 years and I, we've always done it this way or this, that and the other. So that can be a little bit of uh, frustration for me be on that, trying to, because, like, you've got to get your whole board to agree on something. So, you know, sometimes you've got to nobble a couple of the trustees prior to a board meeting and get them so that they know that you're on their side, you know. Uh, and then sometimes a little bit really the structure is for me it's a very small pond Manchester really sort of all the social everybody sort of knows each other within the social care system sort of thing and you tend to find sometimes um, that the certain agencies tend to get the funding at the time because they're in the the little click if you like so sometimes getting yourself to be a accepted in a click of something it can be very very difficult even sometimes you know if you've been doing something for years but somebody's come come in now and you know they've got friends of friends so they get that job or they get that contract so that can be quite a little bit frustrating um what can be difficult as well um i mean we don't really tend to go for for tender contracts or things like that because the hoops and things that you have to go through to get that and the time doing for those bids, that kind of structure then can be too problematic because there's only me doing the funding bids and me trying to do everything. Um, so that can be hard where you, you 
you know, you just can't get through all that sort of red tape or things. And then, and then all, all the amount of uh, monitoring and evaluation would need a full time monitoring and evaluation evaluator just for you know some of the funding that you get for the council. So the bureaucracy and the paperwork that might come with ten thousand pound from a council actually isn't really worth it because it's just cost you 16000 in an admin worker to get do the feedback on the, you know. So that can be um, quite difficult, really, sort of. But we're getting, we're getting better. We're, I mean, I'm just going to be getting the inform system in for casework and things like that, which might help with reporting back on, on numbers. Um, now looking at more collaborative working that's the that's the seems to be the sort of the key at the minute that because for me and i've always said it that you know no one organization can um solve the problem of homelessness or solve one client's issues you know you need to have a signposting system and different ways so working in collaboration um and doing joint bids so that's a new different way of doing things for us but again sometimes finding your collaborative partners is not always the easiest of things and then another one sort of thing is i mean we have our our bank account but then sometimes if you get in a council fund they want you to have a separate bank account just for just for that fund going in and you know at the minute getting another bank account is not really the easiest thing to do at the minute opening bank accounts so those kind of structures and requests that for a small charity are harder to do than maybe shelter as a large national charity have got people who and you do that so as a small little charity you sometimes left out of the big game because you haven't got the hours or capacity to to do all those structural hoops that they want you to do was that yeah yeah absolutely it's uh, uh very interesting um so can you talk a little about uh the successes you've had in the in the form of clients or in the form of changing service or uh you know wh- wh- what you think is important to talk about you know it's uh it's both you know it's um I, well as i say it was the successes was identifying the um male sex workers in manchester and then then going from M swap to cards. Now, when we were M swap male sex workers outreach project, we worked with an organisation that was like an arts based organisation called the Blue Room. So we worked, we made films, we did um, videos, all different things, art stuff, um, plays, and things like that. So when we decided to go more generic. Uh, the Blue Room decided then to turn, you know, we worked with the Blue Room to go into the men's room. So the men's room now is is operating as, as MSWAP used to do. So they're doing the services directly for that client group. So for me, getting the male voice onto the prostitution forum, oh, sex workers forum, sorry, uh, getting them on, onto, um, you know, primary health needs and things like that, that was an amazing piece of work. Um, again, the stuff around modern day slavery and trafficking for Manchester, because it was probably, oh, it might have, God, oh, it's probably now forget, but it might have been about 2003, 2005, when I first worked with my first client who was in, uh, he was trafficked out of Nigeria into, um, no, well, actually, he, he, he came from Nigeria, his mum, his dad, and his sister, then he, he got abandoned, him and his sister got abandoned in London. Uh, he got picked up by a street gang. He never saw his sister again. He believes she got took off to work in a brothel. Uh, he was then treat, uh, he was around about nine at that time. Uh, he was like treat, uh, taught to uh, pinch pockets around the stations, around London stations. So they had to go and pinch phones and be, you know, tag wallets and things like that. Uh, and then when he was um, about 15, he got picked up in Manchester in an immigration raid because at that point they started trafficking, trafficking around the country for sex work. Um, and then that's when he came across, across us sort of thing. And we started, work, well, he started working with him. Um, and now 
you know, he's got his rights to remain, he's engaged to be married, uh, he's at third year in university, he's 28 now, uh, you know, he's a beautiful little girl, and from out of the work that we did with him and a few other young men, then the Modern Day Slavery uh, Forum started, uh, I helped the co-op start the Brighter Futures programme to give people who've been victims of modern day slavery and trafficking a real uh, job. So I think so they have a month's placement where it's a paid placement with the guy. A guarantee of an interview at the end of that, not guaranteed the job, but you've got a good things, you know. So all different things like that came again from us raising that voice. Um, so I, now at the minute, um, on my dissertation, I put a working model through for uh, multidisciplinary teams to go out to work. So you've got multi, you know, you've got GMP, you've got. Um, CJL drugs workers, live share, so it being this side, and that framework's now being used where we're working in that. So I'm quite pleased on that one that, you know, but it's took a long time. One of my other things, I mean, um, Sue Murphy, God rest her soul, Councillor Sue Murphy, she's passed now. But I always remember going into uh, the sex workers forum and she said to me, Judy, you are going to be so pleased today. I said, why is that then, Sue? She said, it's only took 10 years. <laughs> yeah, it's only took us 10 years of you constantly. <laughs> yeah, and it was to get the undercroft locked at night and the lights yeah because where they were doing the cruising and things like that so to get gates and lights down on the undercroft 10 years of lobbying the water board the council and everything we finally got what we asked for and that was 10 years later but that was a result 10 years later um but yeah it's yeah, so those are sort of things. I, I'd say I'm quite pleased. I think when the charitable income has gone up since, you know, I've been... But then you can be a victim a bit of your own success because pots of money that may have always... Smaller pots of money that might have funded life share, then now we break, we're break. we over the the income bracket. So, you know, I think life share was pulling around about 76,000, maybe, when I sort of joined now... You know, we're, we're just sort of, well, 250,000 was one of the best bit, but we're, we're pooling around about two 200,000 now, which again then cuts you off from smaller grants you may have gone to because you've gone over the 150,000 bracket. So, um, yeah, but raising the income of the charity and the team um, and, like, not giving up. Um, although I advocated against street feeding um, when the pandemic hit in, we did go and, and serve street fed, fed from Piccadilly Gardens at the weekend humanitarian breakfast. And then I managed to talk um, the Methodist Church to give us the, the shop uh, on Oldham Street that was, used to be the old pawn shop. Uh, so we used that space with Audacious, uh, Barnabas and Mind. And we did a seven days a week humanitarian breakfast all the way through COVID. And did the Christmas project from there. We're now still we're still serving weekend breakfast from there. Um, we're doing well-being um, event in July to raise awareness around homelessness and harm reduction. And we've got corporates involved with us now. And yeah, so yeah, there, there's quite a few successes. Uh, I still. We're now under threat here. So this building that, you know, I'm going on, I got this in 2007. We're now a threat of a compulsive purchase order on our block and the block behind us that holds the uh, the brothel in it because now uh, Tim Heatley's capital centre of the new Ancoats and the new trendy place for your 25s to 35s to live, Ancoats community where it's so hip and cool to live. You know, our little old Victorian block doesn't look really good in the middle of the glass. So at the minute there is a thing to get rid of the, our building and the building behind. Um, so I'll just have to see women, you know. So it is a constant, you know, my the, um Also as well, I've not got disabled access here, so that's another little thing. So, but where you know if we'd have got permission to build the gateway which is a 10 minute would have been a 10 minute walk up the road to Cuthbert's you know that that would have been built and there now and have been an answer 
but we weren't perhaps in the right club, if you like. So Riverside got the contracts for various things and others again. So it, it sometimes depends who you are as a player. Do the current systems of administration help you achieve these successes? Again, administration within our own organisation. Or in a- uh, uh, and... You know the the administrative systems that you have to uh, work through. Well, going back to so, if we're talking about administrative systems of referral for people to go into the count, you know, to for things. So, like I said to you before about the Mass Gateway, that's an administrative system that throws out the most hard to reach you know people that have got really multiple disadvantage on the streets they don't get past you know the six or seven first questions are too high risk or things like that so yeah I fed into that system that is not going to work because then what happens when you get thrown out of that system without back in the day before I had somebody who on paper looks an absolute nightmare. You know, his offending history is like, you know, sort of war and peace document or whatever. But, yeah, he's a really, really nice person. I know that that person can turn around. He's just perhaps had really bad life choices or he's been through um, criminal exploitation. or what. So I used to be able to pick up the phone, yeah, phone up NACRO or one of my, you know, hostels that I know that I've got a working relationship with the manager with, I'll say, right, Barbara, right, I'm going to send you over this referral. You're going to fall off your chair when you read it, yeah? But trust me, can I bring this young person up to meet you? Yeah, have a chat. We'll set in a boundaries. We'll set in some ground rules. We'll ding it and let's give this young person a chance, Yeah. And that would work now with the administrative systems where you've got to do an ABEN referral. So it's got to go. So you've got bed for every night in Manchester. So they, but again, it's a high risk thing. The bed for every night now will throw everybody in together. So this young person who looks like he's, you know, Ronnie Cray, but actually he's, you know, been Grunet's boy who's really not this person, is suddenly now shoved in with Class A users, you know, people with alcohol issues, 55, 65, who just then see him as somebody who they can then bully and victimise. Whereas if it had been a point where there wasn't these administrative systems where you've got to go through this pathway, yeah, these pathway systems, uh, they just put obstacles. So the pathway to accommodation now it might be centre point, yeah? But a lot of the young people might not want to work at centre point. But now we've got to refer that person to centre point because they've got the key to the door to DePaul. Whereas before, I could just ring DePaul and go, I've got little Johnny here. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Or if it's somebody who is offending, I could ring Barbara at Nacro. Now all that has gone. I've got to go through these systems and the administrative systems throw out the multiple disadvantaged people with the highest risks and offending behaviours and they sort of then end up in this weird sort of cosmos because nobody knows what to do with them. So now they brought in navigators. So there's a navigator team now. So to navigate these people who've been booted out of these systems, yeah? But so that there's more... But the navigators have got nowhere really moved to move them to. Right, so then they're just like with the navigators, but then they're, they're still not really moving anywhere. Sometimes they're actually on the streets for a while because they've got to prove to the navigator that they'll engage for three appointments to show that they're being serious and things like you know. So yeah, the the systems that are now being put in place just cause more problems. There's not not that human element where you can have that conversation with accommodation providers. So yeah. That's pretty um, systems not working, sort of, really. And then, um, again, getting through, if you're trying to get through to PIP or on the telephones or go through different things, those systems, I'm convinced, are geared up to so that your head falls off because you'll be on 45 minutes on hold and then you'll get through, hello, and then it'll just cut off for some bizarre reason. So sometimes I think systems and administrative processes are there to stop you getting in. If that makes sense, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You ain't getting this golden ticket because you know. Um, so yeah, think so. Things like that for me have made more life difficult because, you know, I mean, and also as well, we've got all these people who are stuck in A-bends at the minute and there's nowhere to move them on to. So there's no one-bedroom accommodations within affordable price. So, again, the gentrification of Manchester sort of thing. As before, we didn't have anybody really living in the city centre. Now, you know, you've got all the prices on the edge, on the edges of the city centre, which used to be sort of your ancoats, your little, uh, little Italy and things like that, where, again, nobody wanted to rent or buy. Now they're the up-and-coming affluent areas, so perhaps where people might have been able to afford to rent in an area or look for, they can't do now. It's like we were looking for private landlords before. We might look alongside Levenshoom, Wally Range. Now those areas are all up and coming fancy areas because of the spread of the city. So we can't look to those areas now because the private landlords who would have let to us now know that there's this different group of people coming in they can let to. So, yeah. Um, Then another one might be, so the council might say, oh, there's a list of... um, you know, you know, letting agencies or what you can use, but they want guarantors. Well, how is a young person going to get a guarantor who's got their own house and get their own? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now even getting to the doctors is not a thing. That's an online form. That's another, you know, really? system within itself. You know, you got to apply online for a lot of the doctors and everything now is everything's administrated through an online portal so you know your universal credit journal sort of you know your bank account opening or getting a gp appointment you know uh, manchester move you know everything's got to do through a dig- more or less a digital portal so but those digital portals block are not available to everybody you know um not everybody has access to or wants to yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, there must be lots of there's lots of people who I mean, even perhaps you know my own dad, for instance, um, where might might be entitled to you know he's on a low pension rate, he might be able you know his health is not getting very well, good, he might be able to get something. I think I'm not filling in one of them online forms. I'm not doing that thing. You know what I mean? And he, you know, I'll do it. I don't want. I'll do it for you. No, 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 no. You're not. But yeah, so. You know, there's people who are probably excluded from these administrative systems and are now, suf- you know, suffering because they don't know how to negotiate these systems. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Is that? It, it makes it makes sense. That? Makes sense, and uh, I, I mean, it, it rings true to my experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, can you talk about the difficulties of measuring the outcomes of your work? Yeah, no, this was sort of um, one that I used to, again, when I was always with the comic relief, yeah, with the little boxes and things like that, you know, um, and say, you know, somebody who's perhaps been selling themselves on the streets, saying... I don't know, 15 punters, 15 punters a night or whatever, yeah. Maybe rough sleeping, staying in a hotel, six months down the line, he's now only seeing two or three people. He's on a Subutex script and he's living in a hostel, yeah. For us, that's a positive outcome, yeah, because of the harm reduction side of things. and I mean, But for comic relief, he was he's still selling sex. So sometimes what might be a positive outcome for us, for that young person, is not necessarily a positive outcome for a funder. So sometimes that you find that it again this tick not people don't fit into tick boxes of of things. Um, again, a little bit sometimes um, sh- change doesn't always come right away, or 
so you know so if you've done sort of workshops with somebody or you know put in the you haven't got evidence of how that has changed somebody right away but that person coming back to you and saying well actually since that i i don't go out and do that anymore or, I, i'm not robbing or i'm not you know it's sometimes difficult to try and put that into a box that you've got to tick on things um Again, because we didn't really have, we, you know, I remember around about 2012, I wanted a CRM system that would monitor everything, but we couldn't afford to get one as an organisation or things like that. And again, the trustees didn't back that, uh, even though I put in a, a bid to the big lottery and they said, we love you big, Judy, but you need to um, have a 10-year lease. Yeah, now this is in... Only mine, right? We're in 2021 now. I got this feedback in 2010. 11 years later, I'm still sat in this building. My trustees wouldn't let me have a 10 year lease. Yeah. Um, and they said, you've got to have monitoring and evaluate, value better system. So since 2010, I've been trying to get the informed system outcome star. I wanted a 10 year lease three years ago. Yeah, my, my landlord was willing to give me an af after advice from two funders, so from Lloyds and Tudor, negotiate with your landlord a 10-year lease with a two-year get-out clause for you and the landlord. That way, your funders look good that you've got a 10-year lease, but you've got, it's not really a 10-year lease because you've got your two-year get-out clause. My trustees, my landlord was happy to do it so I could get the bid and resubmit. My trustees wouldn't do it and let me do that. Yeah, and 11 years later, I'm still sat in the same bid and the trustees are still going, why don't you go for the big money? Because when I was at the £250,000 bidding, you wouldn't give me a 10-year lease and you wouldn't give me a monitoring and evaluation system. Yeah, I'm still in the same building and I'm still begging for the system. So so I am, I am hoping that, you know, when we get this informed system and a better way to monitor and evaluate what we do, um, then that might give us a better stance for funding bids sort of thing. At the minute, um, we tend to use case studies and examples and things like that to, you know, as successes and things. Um, but it is very difficult. And then you're monitoring and evaluating of or inputting is as only as good as what you input into the CRM system. So then if you've only got a part-time admin worker and a part-time finance worker, then you can't always um, get everything done and implemented that you want to. Um, and again, that sort of was something that, you know, I've said to my board, you know, I need to invest in. Uh, I got a private philanthropist to invest a few years back to give me a full-time administrator, which I had for about a year, which was great. And then um, she decided on Christmas Eve that I've just had her train, done all the training. She was brilliant, running absolutely. And she said to me, she's going to GMCVO where they don't have out-of-date biscuits and dogs. So I wanted to jump over the table and throckle her because we just put her through accountancy and everything, yeah. So she was with me for a year and then the trustees split the full-time admin post into 16 hours finance and 16 hours admin instead of me having the full... Thing is, so again, the frustrations go with the board mainly. If they'd have given me the the back of house support that I needed, I think that the charity would have grown more. Yeah, yeah. No, sort of. Yeah, um, and then trying to do that, and sometimes like some of these, some of the funding bids that you get might not even be a lot of money, but they want evaluating at three months, and then the the next three months, and you know it's when you've not got much time to do stuff, trying to feed back and evaluate that is too much. Yeah. Can you think of helpful and unhelpful examples of bureaucracies in relation to your work? Um, there's levels of bureaucracy which are, are unhelpful sort of a little bit. Sometimes when like you're dealing with the the council and, and you might be wanting to, you want an answer on something um, at the minute and nobody like wants to give you uh, an answer because it's not their department or such, you know, there's levels where that you, 
like for instance, Christmas project. Um, Manchester shut. It's Christmas Day. There's no buses going down Oldham Street. There's a loading bay outside the shop that we turned into the humanitarian breakfast. There's no buses on Oldham Street at all Christmas Day. I wanted to put a catering van and serve from the van with some carol singers instead of it being just in the doorway of the shop and just handing over this. I wanted a proper catering van and I wanted it in the loading bay. And I could not get through the bureaucracy or the council or somebody to give permission for that to happen. Yeah, I went to Councillor Langbert, who then passed me on to somebody else. Then I went to the roads and something, and I could not get anybody to give permission on Christmas Day to put that van down, which you'd think it'd be the easiest thing in the world, but no. Um, So... Doing an event on Piccadilly Gardens, you know, before now, you you know, you just be able to go and go and do the event or you might just speak to a PSO or a police officer and say, oh, I'm going to be on the gardens uh, two till four. We're, we're doing a stuff with the national citizenship. We used to do things with some students. Now you've got to um, apply to the strategic lead to the city centre, yeah, well, I've emailed the strategic lead six times in the past six weeks, one a week, because I want to do a two-hour event on the 18th of uh, July, which is going to be some food. Is I wanted to do the COVID vaccination van with the Urban Medical Centre and then bring come back on World Homeless Day, which is October the 10th, which is just around about the 12-week period for the second jab. Anyway, we can't get the COVID van, uh, but we can do harm reduction advice and things like that. So the urban want to be involved. We just can't do the vaccines. So trying to get one, the strategic lead, to answer me is another thing again i emailed her again on monday um you know it's harm reduction event and what have you and i'm just not answering uh, and you're having to go and um, now because they're going to enforcement you can't just turn up and do it because you're at risk of enforcement action on you because you brought your vehicle onto the gardens and x y and z so yeah just wanting to do something that you think's for the greater good it's sometimes and I know who the strategic lead is now, but it took me before Christmas when I was trying to find out about the Christmas getting the catering van, actually find out who she was, who I had to go through, took weeks, actually. And then you go through onto the council website and you look who's a portfolio holder and you think that person's in the portfolio holder for something, so you kind of contact them. Oh, no, they left two years ago, you know. So, yeah, the, the, and again, I just feel that it's there to mirror you in the things. But funnily enough, when I did the posters, yeah, the strategic lead for the city centre was the first one to phone up bollocking me. <laughs> <laughs> Manchester, where where was it? We know the we we went on the Tony Wilson. We did a twist. Did you see it? Did you see the the one? No, no. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, so we used the Tony Wilson things where Manchester where they think tables are for sleeping on. Manchester where they think pavements are for sleeping on. Uh, twenty four hour party people was to twenty four hour poverty people and what have you saw. So I'd done. Oh, I'll find it on my iPad. So we'd done some, and they were really massive ones. As you go down to. Uh, on the tram down to the print works, the two big boards there had the uh, poverty people and it's something like life share 38 years back in poverty. We need your help more than ever sort of thing. But then there was the run of the Manchester where they think pavements are for sleeping on. So I says to Mikey Swain, I said, oh, fuck, we can't get away with them. I said, they'll kill me. I said, we'll go with these two, yeah, and we'll put them on the big billboards. We'll pay for them. I said, I'll pay for the billboards. So we had these massive billboards, Shudil, Tramstar, Oxford Road, thingy grey, all framed and all lovely. But then the lads who did the printing loved the where they think thing. So they went and fly posted 52, 52 of the small posters all around Manchester. Oh my God. I getting shit, but uh, but they were great. You know what I mean. But I was like, "Abdicate, 
well, this is what you happens when you take your eye off the ball, Kate. I said, I'm really... Oh, Kate, I said, these are the ones, look, look at the ones, lovely frames on, fine. She said, they're not a problem, it sees the fly, we'll have you done for fly post or whatever. I said, I'm really sorry. I said, the people who printed them took it off the wrong back and then, you know, got away with that one. But, yeah, they were all over the place. I could have throttled them, Mikey Swain. So they were good, yeah. <laughs> Manchester, where they, th- uh, they think pay- pavements are sleeping on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's funny, if you upset one of them, you, the funny how quickly they can find you, but when you want to know something or do something or get any help, you know, it's another thing. Um, you know, even getting back, trying to get sort of um, community asset transfer building or anything like that, the bureaucracy around that you know and yeah it's just levels and levels of it you know I'm curious have, have you come across any helpful bureaucracies um, nothing springing in my mind that's helpful bureaucracy um, and another thing with the problem with the bureaucracy, you can build a relationship, like say it's with the police, so you've got chief inspector, who's the chief inspector over the city centre. He, he can be really great. He could be into harm reduction. He could be against enforcement. He could be working with you and get, you know, and then the chief inspector changes and then that changes the tip on the, on the suddenly now it's gone to enforcement and things like that. So it depends on who's the lead on things, on... Um, whether you get through that level of bureaucracy a, a, a lot. Um, I mean, Bernstein, a lot of people didn't like, but um, what's he, what his first name when it comes to Bernstein? Um, but again, I could phone it for he's not now, he, he, he got sort of put yeah. out to pasture and um, should have put Richard Lees out to pasture. Oh. But anyway, <laughs> um, but. I could phone him, um, you know, and say, oh, this, that, and that. He even came down to breakfast and met me at half seven in the morning down at breakfast to see the issue and raise the voice, but I don't know whether his voice then wasn't welcome because suddenly he'd gone from the council, you know, so whether he was, like, he wanted to keep the Charter Street ragged as a com- community thing, he wanted to keep life share within that building and keep, keep it as a community asset. But then, of course, the other powers of the B didn't want it because they wanted that to be the gate. It was the gate, it was the start of Andy Burnham's gateway to the north. So so I don't know whether he was too much onto our side and suddenly he just completely went and he was the one who promised me that you will be looked after and then he'd gone and then nobody were looking after us. So that might have been a... a a pathway in which might have been which I thought was helpful but then ended up didn't being helpful because they just got rid of him so yeah. uh, well that, that brings us on to the interestingly to the next question how often do the funding administration systems change and do they have continuity mm, no well it's as I said before, again, sort of when we had a smaller income, then there were sort of certain certain streams that you could go for that you knew that would sort of fight your sort of course. And a lot of them was you know, now because we're in a bit of a higher income, it's harder to find um, the the fund funding pots, if you like. Sometimes it's really that you can be reading the criteria on on a funding part, uh, which is reams and reams and reams of pages, and then just something in the last box excludes you. So it, that's not easy to find. Um, now, for me being dyslexic, now I find these funding portals that they all, you know, you've got thing you've do them on a portal and you've got to do it right into but that for me they're not not as easy to fill in sort of thing um um and then funders sort of have their outcomes and um agendas that were there looking looking at um you know like lloyd's lloyd's might have but the only perhaps the only one 
core costs is a really hard one to get funds for as well, you know, or getting funds for, for your finance or your administrator. That's sometimes always really, really difficult to do. Um, um, I mean, I was on some fun, funding um, thing yesterday around, around trauma, um, looking at sort of delivering on that, and they didn't want to... They didn't want to fund the delivery of the project. They wanted to... I still can't get my hand around actually what they wanted to fund. <laughs> but they didn't want to... They didn't want to really do... Uh, yeah, some of it is really... Uh, it's hard to work out sometimes. They'll pick, they want to fund parts of it, but then they don't want to fund the back of house to support it. And if you haven't got your finance and your admin costs and your rent covered, then... You know, it, it it's very difficult. Or they want to do a proportion, like Lloyd's only pay like twenty five thousand towards the team leader's salary, but we support the team leader at twenty seven thousand. You know, so then you've got to find the shortfall on that money. So, um, yeah, we, we've gone down the road a lot of co- looking at corporate funding now. So looking at snoozling corporates and things like that for their corporate uh, responsibility and things like that. But then the pandemic has hit a bit, so there's not as much money around on the corporate front as what there was before. Um, so it's just just real difficult all the time to look at the best ways to do things and donate buttons on sites and different things, you know, and it's... Do you have just just giving? Do you have this one? Do you have that? You know, every click or, you know, or do you have different ones so people have got autonomy of choice, you know, because I've got one trust, because we're on all kinds. When I had my full-time admin, admin worker, we went on all kinds of random little things that people could donate on. Didn't cost us a penny, to be on it. Might have only brought us a... F- a fiver through the scouts something or we might have got fifty pounds through it, but no work from from that initial setting it up on that site, Sam might have spent twenty minutes putting a bit of a profile on it and a donate button. Nothing happy days and randomly you get a bit of money. So we've now got a trustee saying that we should get rid of all these individual different mad thingies and just go with one particular one. But to me that's then although that doesn't make sense because that little button that was on the scouts thing that would get the odd didn't cost us anything doesn't think you know so and i for me i prefer to have a lot of choice on different things you know rather than people saying you've got to deal you can only donate to live share through every click or just giving you know that's people want choice yeah yeah do the funding structures allow you to plan long term? No. No, not really, not long enough, really, because things they're, they're looking to for maybe fund you for a year. So, like, Jamie's salary from the Make Some Noise funding it, I've got that for a year. So, more or less, as soon as that lands, I'm now having to look for funding to how do I continue this role on. Um, i got... <laughs> Mayor's Fund funding, again, from a multidisciplinary thing. Andy bought, bought my bid, and he also put in the same framework in four other organisations to work in that pathway, yeah, but only funded it for a year, yeah. So, again, now I've got to start looking at, well, where do I now find that? Because we've proved it's worked, it's a pilot sort of thing, yeah, but then will that funding then go to somebody else in a different framework. So we've proved the pilot, I designed it, we're all working on it now. Is that now going to be taken away from us and that funding pot now suddenly won't be available for us and it'll be, I don't know. But, yeah, no, three years, and even three years funding's not really that great a time to plan, you know, because you string the three years before you know it. It's like I'm at three years now and I'm not... I wanted to, I should have done my uh, letter of inquiry at Christmas to Tudor um, and my board said they wanted to change my job description so told me to hang fire doing the in foot and it's two stage application so you have to put your first stage in which is sort of a basic of your idea and what have you and if they buy it on that then they invite you to the second stage um, 
application that you fill that in then you might get a third one where you're asking for extra information um and what have you so the process just to get in that fund could take nearly 12 months you know so no it doesn't really give you that much security and that's why the the big lottery who can do who do 10-year projects you know get a 10-year lease get your monitoring system that was a 10-year grant so that gives you the time to develop and and grow a little bit whereas your small little pots of money is not you know you could have the figures at the end of it but you know what then you've where do you, you know you've just done a year you've got this worker <coughs> Who's singing, dancing, rolling on it now? It's all really good, but you cannot find anything to continue those. Yeah, or who funded it don't want to fund criminal justice anymore, or they don't want to, you know, they only want to, you know, the key word now with um, homeless link is transitional. So, how is that transitional? How is that, how is that making somebody transition to something? How is feeding somebody transitional? Yeah, I had this massive argument the other day because Manchester for the cold weather provision, yeah, we're putting in uh, the homeless link if the bid out and your bid's got to be supported by Manchester City Council, yeah. So, um, but without a food out element into it and without, like, people are not going to transition on because they're going to be hungry, they're going to be ratty, they're going to be, you know, so it's still your Maslow hierarchy, you know, and you still need those basic ones. And without those basic, you're not going to transition to anything else until you've got something in your belly, until you're, you know. So ours is the weekend out of ours part of this, and we're, we're putting five bids in on the city. So it was where does Lysha's Breakfast Project sit and on whose collaborative bid, you know, uh, and then, well, how is that transitional if you're feeding somebody? So now we've got, although our breakfast project is key to the weekend provision, because we're food signposting and things like that, it's not seen as transition. But everybody needs basic food, hygiene, clean, yeah. And without that, you're not going to transition to the next stage so sometimes yeah the wording on these funding things and what they're looking for is not really realistic yeah uh, do, do you feel you have the latitude to implement the policies you feel are important Um. well yeah, if we, if if we are you talking on a policy sort of around sort of um, safeguarding and things like that? Uh, yeah, well, well, I I guess you know you, you're you're on the ground. You're looking at how the city is changing, people's needs are changing. Mm. Uh, I, I guess uh, the the latitude to do what you you think is necessary and appropriate at the time um yeah i mean we what probably sue wants to speak to me at me about that and then at the minute we with the policy and following these flow charts that they have now yes because everything's a flow chart into accommodation a flow chart into safeguarding and at the head top of this safeguarding flow chart yeah is this portfolio holder or the, this mystery safeguarding lead can anybody actually find or get to them is a different matter yeah so at the minute sue's got the thing where the safeguarding might be sat here with this mystery safeguarding lead person who's not actually met the person that they're supposed to be safeguarding or is not even, you know, hasn't got time to come to a meeting, but yet this person's on the streets and so we're working within that policy. We've referred them through. We're asking for the safeguarding meeting, but this actual lead is not there to follow through the things. So sometimes you can have your your pathway and your flow chart of how this policy is supposed to work and support somebody, but then it's lost when it gets to the top ranking stage of it because you can't find who this head of this safeguarding lead is or one thing, or you can't get them to the meeting and they're the person who does the final decision on it. So sometimes, um, 
you know, you could have got a person all the way up ready for detox, but it needs this mystery person to sign the finances off that you can't get a hold of. So now this person who's ready, Eddie, today, I want to go, I want to go today. Well, no, we've got to work. Well, well, Barbara comes back in on Monday and she'll look at your thing. And if Barbara thinks that you're ready, then she'll release the funds because Barbara's the lead on the, yeah, well, that's no use to Fred, who's now ready. So while he's waiting for Barbara, he's just going to score 120 quids with the rock and he's back on the roller coaster again. So sometimes, yeah, you could try and work within the policy and flow chart guidelines, but then bureaucracy, it's our thing, it doesn't match up. Or, so that doesn't really work. Um, so citywide, again, sort of thing, although, like, you know, the policy was, you know, no street feeding in Manchester. Enforcement will come on anybody who tries to do it. But then we had a pandemic. So although I did to the policy before the pandemic, when I was kicked out of my building, I ripped the policy up and went and did the feeding on the street. Ah, I've not agreed to that anywhere. <laughs> Never signed that in my life, no. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so is that sort of around things like that? Um, yeah. Um, is is there any anything else on on that that you wanted? I didn't want to cut in there. Mm. No, if it's things, if it. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you one one thing. Right. So another one that might be. So. Going back to like sort of the rough sleepers are the use of, like the council team, yeah. If you weren't funded by the council, you weren't invited to the meeting, yeah. yeah. But the charity organisations have the information about the client that they are all meeting about, but you're not welcome because you're you're it's seen as us and them. So we're the charity, although we know the person, we're, we we know what's happening. We can't go to that meeting because we're not funded by the council. But then they want us to give us the meet, the information before the meeting so that they can sit in that meeting and talk about it off the information that we've given them sort of thing. So that, that policy and sort of thing where you feel it's a bit us and them, you're not funded by us, so you can't come and sit in the same room with us, but yet you're working with Joe Boggs on the street and you're the one with the thing. Because, like, so she's like, this safeguarding lead on one of the girls and she's been safeguarding lead for two years, has never, ever met the girl. But, yeah, is wheeling the axe on decisions on this girl's life, but has never met the girl. So, yeah. So sometimes policies um, and things can be there in, a, in an ivory tower, if you like, really, that don't really transgress to Joe Bloggs on the streets living in, in you know, the doorway or something like that. There should be a policy there to protect him or whatever, but really, in theory, it doesn't work. Yeah. Are you able, through existing structures, uh, to forge the connections with outside organisations that you think are important? Yeah, I think... Manchester, in a way, we are quite lucky because we have, like, um, Mac, um, we have GMCVO, we have NCVO, um, so we have sort of a community, you know, Salford, CVS and things like that. So sometimes if you want to forge relationships with some people, are going, you can go to, like, Mac and ask for advice of them and link in with sort of groups that you might not have known about so it's rather trying to get a yellow pages out and trying to think who's in the same kind of field as us so there is sort of places that you can go is that what you mean to get yeah well you know it's you know this org you you you're you're working in this organization there's an organization over there and it, it in your mind with all the, your experience you're a good fit yeah. Uh, can you walk over there? Can you pick up the phone? Uh, you touched on this earlier. Yeah. Now, me, because I'm bullshit and think it, I, I would do, you know what I mean, and sort of thing. But um, 
it's not always uh, as easy because sometimes uh, you know you get something oh I don't need to deal with that or, or or we're you know especially if it was centre point or shelter we can't make a local particular decision without running it by their head office in London or something like that. So, so although you might want to do something, you know, you you've got to run it through their main main office, even though that like the people who work at at Centre Point, um, which is through um, YPS or whatever it was called before that, um, you know, they they've known you for years, but the policy person in London or the person that you want to, you know, they don't know you from Adam, so it's it's a bit difficult. But it's a bit more local, yeah, then you're not afraid to. Um, and I think at the minute now where on some funding bids, like I was saying about that trauma one that, you know, you're saying you need people to collaborate with you. So a bit now people are realising they've got to collaborate with other organisations, whereas before everybody was a little bit, oh, they'll be going for the same funding at all, so better not collaborate with them or tell them too much because they might nick our funding and things like that. Um, so, yeah, if I wanted to go and think in a some more of that I might just as I say use Mac maybe and say can you introduce me or suggest anybody you know so they've got a bit of funding to match people up for different grants as well depending on where the money's coming from but um, I miss a lot of stuff because I just haven't got the uh, time to or a bid writer to read and look at all the different portals that are, are there and up you know and then sometimes what I find is with the council or even with crime and disorder and things like that, if there's a funding pot, they'll sh they'll sell, tell the voluntary sector the week before the deadline. But the boys they wanted to get it knew about the pot three months ago. Yeah? So I've noticed that happening quite a bit, to be honest with you, that things, I'm like... Oh my God, how comes that? And then somebody will, will go to me, oh, no, I knew about that two months ago. I've been working on that bid for, well, how did you know about that two months ago? Because that's only just come out now because they already knew who they wanted to go for it. So they, I find a bit of that, that sometimes things are only released. Or, I remember me being paranoid, but I don't think it, because I've noticed it a lot recently, that you've only got like a short window to get your bid in. Yeah. But yet you find some people who've got, got you know, who knew about the bid already. Yeah. So I think again, it depends on your networks and you know who you know a bit really. Do you feel the language used in administration and outcomes and measures uh, represents adequately represents you in the work you do? Say that again. Do you feel the language used in administration? And outcomes and measurements, uh, like I mean, you you were speaking talking about transition. Yeah, you know, it's all, you know it's, it's the there's always. I think there's always these buzzwords, if you like. You know, it, now that's the new buzzword. So it's transition now seems to be the buzzword floating around, and not not necessarily always um, helpful. You know, sort of. Um, Again, goes to that not clients not fitting in boxes, you know what I mean. So people can't be put into a box for this and a box for that. Um, so some of the some of the terminology and the, the don't identify, it. and then and then they're saying to get people with lived experience and things like that, which is absolutely great. The voice and. But then you get them and they're like, well, what's that word mean? Or what are they on about like that? So sometimes they want the people who are, it's happening and they're living through that, but yet the terminology that they're using that they want them to describe it is not their voice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that can be sort of a bit of a, an issue, really. And again, looking at, the expectation of an outcome, you know, so somebody, you know, for somebody who might have been using, I don't know, 
three grams of heroin, four rocks a night, who's suddenly now using one bag and one rock, and then, you know, going down then to half the bag. So that, that's a massive change in an outcome for them, but it's not necessarily the outcome that your funder wants to show because they want to see subutex creep not using. But, you know, somebody might not want to go on a methadone or subutex. They might want to do it on a gradual reduction on their own. So, again, that takes away the personal choice of the person and that the issue is happening to, if you like. So, um, you know, and boxes with things like, you know, so it's LGBT or bisexual. No, it's just men who have sex with men. It's not, not, not sexuality or anything like that. You know, so sometimes getting people to put the, you know, what it is down. Um, so, yeah, sometimes the wording and things, you know, blocks you away from it yeah are you thinking what do they mean by that what are they looking for in that you know yeah. mm. um do you feel the sector or your work is adequately funded or resourced no uh no because not really no i mean i don't know because ugh, getting like, for instance, that trauma training, yeah? There's £75,000 up for grabs, yeah? But that's got that's got to spread over five bids. So, and there was 40 people on that, just the one car, on the one webinar that we were doing about it, you know, to be all chasing a, a slice of the pie that would be ten to £15,000. And again, it was the ten to £15,000 come with three months monitoring sort of thing so every three months you're gonna to have to be doing a monitoring but you're only getting 10 to 15 thousand um so yeah i go into and like sort of if you look at um council funding or things like that you know that it's not always they might want you to change the way that you give doing things so we give out sleeping bags but it might change what rule should broader society play in facilitating your work? What role should... Well, I think everybody should have an element of sort of social conscience, if, if you like, or thinking more about sort of things. So... So, for instance, like, we're looking for the device, devices, so it, for people to redistribute devices. So if society as a, as a whole thought, right, I've, I've now finished with this phone, yeah? I'm going to get a new phone, so I'm not even going to think twice about that. I'm going to put that in a bag. I'm going to send that to the homeless child for some somebody thing. Or is somebody that, right... I, I will contribute, you know, imagine if everybody said, right, I'll contribute 50, 50p out of my wages a week, yeah, into a, a pot for the voluntary sector to be able to, you know, pop into sort of thing. So maybe, I don't know, is that the sort of thing? If you're looking at wider society. Yeah, I mean, how, a very open question. Yeah, how, how do I, wider society could be more sort of, but that goes down to humanity as a whole, is not it, really? Um, about things not being disposable all the time and what 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 one's man's rubbish is another man's you know livelihood sort of thing if you like um so it, i think society as a whole does have a, a good sort of element but giving to charity but i think it should be more more inbred in, in really into us from, from a younger age of volunteering or giving something back. I think there's too much in society now where everybody expects something for nothing, yeah, whereas there should be that thing where, you know, you there's an element of giving back that is instilled in you from day one sort of thing. So, I don't know. Yeah, something like, like that, really. Um, maybe making making more like companies more ethically thinking about um 
getting rid of the stock. So instead of like, you know, sending load of stuff that might just have a little bit of a floor in it to a landfill because it's not good for the shop, then, you know, companies thinking about that needs to go to charity or, you know, goods goods instead of going to landfills, looking at who, who they could go to and things like that. So... Um, that would that would help. Uh, how how might uh, Manchester's finest? I think you call mm-hmm. them. Yeah, you know, lots of words get used. Clients, service yeah, yeah. users. How, how do you think they might best support you in delivering support? Mm. I mean, they advocate sort of for, for us and we use do your people that come back who've been through services and then come back as a supported volunteer and things like that. So so coming back and giving back. Um, I, when we had Danzig Street, we were able to do more supported volunteer placements and things like that before Matt passed. Um, you know, and clients would like they've been through and got back and they come back a couple of years later and do helping the stores or helping the kitchen at breakfast and things like that. Um, so, and a lot of uh, excuse me, quite good ambassadors, you know, because so when people on the street, oh, it looks like, oh, I share, mate, they rock on, you know. <laughs> so we do have good word of mouth of our clients, but um, I think sometimes. I would like um, the young person's voice on the board. So I would like, you know, um, being on interview panels. So that that would be good if you if you actually have somebody who's been through the service or is in the service. Um, and they will do use if you ask them, you know, will you t- take part and things like that. So being involved in service living, I mean, we have... We used to have suggestion boxes, but some of the suggestions that I used to put out, we were like, we're not doing that. Yeah, I'm not even reading that one out, you know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, be, having having the ones who use your service involved in the service delivery and development, I think, is important. You know, um, asking what you want and what they want to do. It's like when we're doing the digital thing, and said, well, like, Pat, when you've done the basics, the boring stuff, what other programmes do you want us to get? And we'll look at doing those. Oh yeah, we want uh, video making thing is three D modeling. I was like, right, we can have it, but no guns being made, <laughs> no guns, you know. Um, so that voice is is sort of good to have them, yeah. And then I've got one lad who who now he goes doing the battle of the bands, you know, where basically two people slag each other off your mother, yeah, yeah. But he has Deviant on the front of his hoodie and Live Share on the back, and he goes all around the country, you know, because he come through Live Share, so he does that. But he he does it wearing a Live Share hoodie. Uh, awesome. Um, and the last question is: What questions do you think are important? in working towards better understandings? Um, ask, 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 asking, asking people that own the stories and, and asking people what they want and what would help them and what, you know, getting the voice, asking people really um, and having that voice and taking into consideration that voice, not, doing something I think like again going back to that Maz way, you know, they asked us it wasn't just me who said that system's not gonna work. I was the one who actually stood up in all of hundred and odd people and told him right off. But so what was the point of a consultation on something if you're gonna do it anyway? So questions are asked, this is the way that this is going to be a pathway, what do you think then? So everybody puts in, that's not going to work. But if the the government or the your local council have already decided they're doing it, yeah, and it's a tokenistic consultation, yeah, um, so no more tokenistic consultations, basically, and, you know, looking at, you know, what people want. I mean, I, I remember Bezzy, they, they spent... When the um, where the city ground is, they spent something like one and three quarter million pounds, or maybe a bit more than that, than the beer the, on the beer the bang. Remember the sculpture? 
Uh, Do you remember with the spikes off it? Yeah. Request had gone in for an extension to the eye hospital that was something like one and a half million. So it was less than that. The B of the bang won it, got the money, not the eye hospital, yeah? And we all know the story about that, about the spikes falling off. But did they ask the basic people, did they want a beer the bang statue? You know, would they have preferred a community centre that the young people could have gone to, you know? So having proper consultations with people that are affected by it, not tokenistic things, you know? I mean... Going back up to the gateway of the north, where you got, uh, you see, did you watch Mantopia? The small, the, you know, those those women who bought their houses, 30, 40 council houses, those small thing, they've all gone now, they've lost them. Now, why did they not put new cladding or change their houses so it fitted in? So it, because it was only because they, um, it didn't fit in with the lay and what the, the other buildings look like. Well, why didn't they make them fit in? Why did they have to move them? Yeah? yeah. You know what I mean? And move out those people and nobody listened, you know? I mean, it, you know, but everybody's going, oh, it's really sad. But then people, they got pets buried in the gardens that have been there. You know, the pets have been in there 30 years. Mm-hmm. They, they, how proud they were that they'd gone from renting to being able to buy their own house and then just to be tuffed and sold off so easily yeah. you know so yeah not doing at people doing with not at yeah uh, Judy Vickers thank you very much <laughs> this is- you know, I really appreciate your time. 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 Really appreciate your time.